Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Before we get started, if you wish to hear this webinar in Spanish, please make sure to click the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. Si desea escuchar este seminario web en español, por favor oprima el botón de interpretación en la parte inferior de su pantalla. Mi nombre es Valerie Groest. I am Valerie Groest. I am an Olympic swimmer from Guatemala, the creator of this webinar series, and I'll be your host for today. Welcome to this new edition of Underwater Chats by Panama Aquatics. It was created by and for athletes with the goal of creating a safe conversation space for crucial subjects of development and support that are not commonly discussed in the aquatic community. We have a great webinar prepared for you today, Battles in and Out of the Pool. We will discuss topics including balance, resilience and overcoming adversity, handling multiple pressures, and taking the opportunity when presented with it. So we have an amazing panel joining us as we embark in this conversation. So first we have Lani Cabrera, an Olympic swimmer from Barbados. Lani, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm Lani Cabrera, Olympic swimmer from Barbados, um, born and raised in the Caribbean, but I kind of moved over to the U.S. at 17 to uh, train in hopes of making the Olympics. I trained at Florida Gulf Coast University and graduated in 2016. Um, and from there, during my time at Florida Gulf Coast, I was fortunate to be on a pretty diverse uh, swim team. So I've trained uh, with for my university, but also at the same time, my coach was training me hand in hand for major aquatic events, FINA events on, and the Olympics. So after that, I swam just a few short years and now I'm uh, thrilled to be here today. Thank you for having me, Valerie. It's been an honor swimming with you over the years. You've done so much for distance swimming in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. So it's full. It's really nice to come back here full circle and chat with you today about kind of the years in the past, the good old days, let's say. So thanks for having me and I'm thrilled to be part of the panel. This awesome lineup tonight, today, excuse me. Thank you so much for joining us. And yes, it's amazing to see you again. We were talking about how it's been almost five years since I've seen you. So it's awesome. Thank you so much. And then we have Bill May, an artistic swimmer from the United States. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And Valerie, thank you for organizing. It's an honor to be with all of you. I'm an artistic swimmer from the U.S. I competed at the first mixed duet, um, competition at the World Championships in 2015. And now I am the Pan American Artistic Swimming Athlete Rep, as well as the World Aquatics Athlete Rep. And I just became the head coach of the Santa Clara Aquamaids, which are an artistic swimming club in California. Um, and I'm happy to say that they actually just included men into the Olympics. So now two men can swim on the team at the Olympics. So, you know, it's people like all of you that have helped secure that and to motivate these swimmers and to support them. So thank you again for all of you. Um, all of your help and all of your support through all these different trials and tribulations and everything that is put in front of us. So thank you. And thanks again for coming today. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. And today we also have with us Monica Hermosillo, a swimmer from Mexico. Hello, all. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm very excited. Uh, yes, like you said, I used to be a swimmer for Mexico. I represented Mexico in Central American Games where I won four gold medals. Um, Pan American Games, where I won a bronze medal, and um, at World Championships and many other meets. I also used to swim in college uh, at Texas A&M under the best coach ever, Steve Boltman. And I also swam a couple of years under the men's coaches, uh, Jay Holmes and Jason Kalanog. Very excited to be here today. Super excited to have you here too. Um, and last but not least, we have Bria Larson, a swimmer and Olympic gold medalist from the United States. Hello everyone. I am so excited to be here. I'm really excited about this series in general, just talking about the mental health and other aspects within swimming. Um, I swam for Team USA for about 10 years or so. Um, I got a gold medal in the Olympic Games, World Championships, uh, bronze in Pan Am or Pan Pacific Games um, and lots of World Cups and ISL meets. Um, I am so excited to kind of help create a cultivative experience where everyone realizes that competitions are phenomenal to go to, but they're just competitions and what it can actually take to get there. 
Totally. No, we're so excited to have you here with us. We appreciate it. And it is really for us as the Underwater Chats team to have such an incredible panelist, um, such incredible panelists for this edition of the Underwater Chats. So before we get started, let me say briefly how the webinar will unfold. First, we'll open up the conversation with our panel, and then we'll transition into our Q&A section. So please enter your questions in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen at any point during the webinar. And with that, we can get started. Um, so really something that's very much discussed in the aquatic community is how resilience is usually one of the traits that most defines aquatic athletes. And you all here are trailblazers for your sport. And you all have very different paths in your aquatic journeys full of ups and downs. So can you share with us what were some of the hardest challenges that you faced and what steps you took to overcome them? I have a good oatmeal story. Um, so I actually joined uh, club swimming when I was 17. Um, so I was very far behind and I managed to get a partial scholarship to Texas A&M um, after swimming for a year. And that did not, one, make me very many friends. I don't know many athletes in general who'd be happy to have an incoming teammate um, who had pretty decent credentials with less experience. So it was difficult actually navigating um, the political and social atmosphere with that in mind. But I remember my freshman year, um, I was so far behind in experience that there were some mornings <laughs> dramatically as a 17 year old, I thought I might drown that day and I wasn't going to make it. And I remember there was one morning in particular where I was so far behind um, during a breaststroke set that my coach had me stay afterwards to finish it so I could catch my breath and get over a panic attack. <laughs> so um, I finished the set on my own. And I remember going to the locker room, dragging my, my bag behind me and being so happy. They couldn't see me cry beneath my goggles. And I went to the dining hall and I sat down with a big trough of food ready to dig in. And I tried to take one bite of my oatmeal and I was so fatigued and exhausted that I started gagging on my food. I, I couldn't eat. I was so tired. I couldn't eat. I thought I was either going to fall asleep or just, I, I couldn't function. I was it. That was it. I was tapped out. So I think I managed to take a couple of bites and I went back to my dorm room to try and take a nap before class, but my muscles were twitching so hard that I couldn't fall asleep. So I texted my mom this overdramatic message about seven pages long because we didn't have iPhones and they had actual pages and text messages and um, just, you know, very carefully explaining to her that although she has seven kids today, she would have six tomorrow because I was going to drown, sink to the bottom of the pool, no one would notice, and I would just slowly dissipate in the chlorine. <laughs> I, I didn't want to be there. I asked her for a plane to get home. I didn't think I was smart enough. I didn't think I was fast enough. I didn't think I was good enough. I didn't know why I was there. I was questioning everything in that very dark place of your mind where nothing is right, everything is wrong, and you don't want to be there. So she sent back this very simple message, and I still use it all the time. And it, she clearly just stated, this is what it feels like to be a champion. How tired you feel and how hard you're working. This is what champions do. And so it was at that moment where my uh, like mental side of the sport really exploded off trying to realize that your mentality behind what you're going through makes a very big difference and noticing that your mind is actually full of different mental muscles. So let's say the emotion of happy is an actual muscle in your brain. And if it's weak at that point, it's okay. You can do exercises to strengthen it. But I think I just always go back to that oatmeal story of being too tired to eat your oatmeal. And that might've been the lowest point until I learned how to kind of activate the mental side of swimming and how to form that resilience is not being able to eat oatmeal. <laughs> Yeah. And thank you for sharing that story. I think it, that's something that most of us don't even realize, like what really goes behind uh, that competition or that achievement. And something you said, like thinking you're not smart enough or that you don't belong there. It's something that so many of us experience and it's so hard to get past. Right. Um, so really just finding that support system that, you know, can make you understand this is what it takes to get where you want to get to. So thank you for sharing that story. Um, and if any other panelists want to share their, their stories. Um, I can go off of that. I think uh, one of the key things that everyone here on the panel has in common and that ultimately got us to where we are is perseverance. Um, I think when I was very, very young, 
Um, I experienced success at a very, very young age, like 13. I didn't really train much, but you know, I was tall, I was lean, I was talented. So that was enough to really like get me going and starting to compete amongst, you know, the best in my country that were a lot older than me. And then I experienced many, many years of a plateau. Uh, my body started to develop. I wasn't used to it. Um, I needed to change my stroke completely. And it took me years of very, very lows and where not only did I not improve my times, I couldn't even come close to the times that I was swimming before. And everyone around me was getting better and faster and making meets and uh, qualifying for all these great things that I wanted to be a part of, but just couldn't. And really it was just perseverance and trying every single thing and uh, out, out doing my options until finally one day I broke that plateau. And I think just experiencing that low for that many years and not giving up is what set the foundation for me for the rest of my career. I knew that if I could get through that, anything else in my career, I could get through with perseverance and hard work. Yeah. And thank you for sharing that because so many athletes go through that, even if, you know, you're going through sets of two months that that happens to that happens for three years, you know? So for, in your case, how long did that take and what was your motivation to keep going? It was probably around four years. Um, and it was my teenage years. So from like 13 to 17, and I think what really uh, changed my attitude completely was in high school, I went to train in Germany for one year and I kind of got on the team there just because my mom used to swim for the coach that was there. So it was like uh, an invitation to swim there, but I was the slowest person on the team. I was training with, you know, Olympians and world medalists. So I could not complain. I had to keep up and just watching these people what they were doing, their mindset through it all, completely changed mine as well. It was contagious. Um, and yeah, I, I knew where my goal was and I think I'm a little stubborn and I was just never willing to give up on that goal. And ultimately um, I got there, you know? Yeah, a hundred percent. That's such a good example of when that happens, what you need to do, surround yourself with the best team out there. 100%. I think that's a really good example, uh, especially for like maybe the other islands or the smaller countries in the Pan Amer in the Americas, because you think about the fact where you have these lows and it happens to like probably eight out of 10 athletes. And I've been there myself, you know, I went through that same moment where I was achieving a lot when I was younger and then I kind of hit poverty, I had the same kind of situation and you really have to really 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 persevere to continue even through that and for four years like that's super impressive to really think like okay I can do this I'm going to continue and nothing's going to break me and that's that you really have to keep pushing even if it feels like there's not that light at the end there's not that success coming again but if you continue to push then it's a perfect example that you can't give up on yourself and you have to just keep pushing through it yeah, yeah. and I, I agree with you guys and it's you know, your perseverance, stubbornness. I think for me, I was an artistic swimmer and I got into it by chance. My sister wanted to do it and I didn't really know anything about the sport. And I did it like all of us purely because we loved it. And then over time, people started asking me, why do you do this sport? Why do you do this sport? You know, and then I had to turn it back on myself and I think, why do I do this sport? You know, they would say, you can't go to the Olympics. And that's what I say. Yeah, but a lot of people won't go to the Olympics, but there's nothing wrong with doing a sport. So it actually, my stubbornness and when people would kind of put that wall in front of me, that made me stronger because again, I had to turn it back onto myself and look into myself and know that I did a sport because I loved it. Not because I was looking for someone else's, you know, like how they felt about me or, you know, where I could go or where the sport would bring me. Because when we do think about it, we do a sport, not for the overall success or the medals that we'll win, but it's because we love it. You know, and I think the more that we can internalize that, that's what made me kind of go further and further and further, whether I'll ever go to the Olympics or not, it gives me, you know, a medal in my heart that no one can ever take away. Can we put that in a bottle and sell that? <laughs> <laughs>
Totally. Now that artistic swimming just got new rules where there is now the possibility for men to compete, we're all rooting for you, Bill. <laughs> yeah. And and really like and and this question like segue into that like Bill you were really the first man to win a world championship gold medal in artistic swimming, so how did that shape not only your own career but the vision for the development of sport itself? You know, like again, I feel like my head is so much different than, um, like I I I feel like I. I maybe should think about things different, but you know, that was an opportunity and it wasn't just for me because my coach, my coaches have never let me quit. You know, my parents have never let me quit. My friends, I had a lot of support, all the athletes, like they're always so kind to me that I feel like, you know, like I had these opportunities that it wasn't just me competing at this competition. <clears throat> like uh, my entire career just seems like it wasn't just me. It was all of these people helping me. So when I won that uh, medal, I felt like, success for all of us because I know I couldn't have done it alone there were so many people that had helped me and I felt like my career was a cliche because I nobody like every time that someone would stand in front of me it was almost like they were giving me the opportunity to push them aside and say no no one's going to define my career whether where I go what I do and now I feel like every day I'm living a dream because now I can go back and help younger athletes and I see more men getting involved and not just more men more females that want to swim with men so I think as a sport, it just helps everything grow. And that's where, like, again, that's what's, that's where my success comes from. Yeah, a hundred percent. And speaking of opportunities when presented with them, uh, we do get them a lot during our careers, right? Like learning more about the sport, having these, you know, like differences in representation as well. Like we're, we're seeing that even more and more as the years go by and really having, um, you know, different opportunities also like education development like how do we take care of our bodies that's not the standard of what a body should look like like it should be nourishing your body for you know performance like everything is changing especially now like how did you manage taking opportunities when presented with them whether it was you know learning more about your sport learning more about yourself sponsorships you know the opportunity to go to championships um is there any advice that you have when it comes to that decision making process I think I would say that opportunities don't always present themselves to you just out of the blue. It's something that you have to create. It's something that you need to know which opportunities do I want themselves to present to me? And you have to go and create them. You have to put yourself in the right place at the right time. Um, preparing yourself, like preparation is what creates opportunities. So uh, not just by sitting on the couch in your house, you're going to get all these opportunities knocking on your door. You really have to do something about it. So training, optimizing your nutrition, optimizing, you know, technique. There's so many resources out there for technique. Like everything, every little detail you work on is going to improve the opportunities that are going to come knocking on your door. Yeah. yeah. I do want to speak to the education. Sorry, excuse me. Go, go for it, go for it. Well, just really quickly, I would say further to the education aspect as well is having good people in your corner. So knowing that you have a coach that you can really trust in or family, friends, even teammates, I think it goes a long way because you have kind of that support as well to help push you towards the opportunities or help you create these opportunities for yourself. And then you have more of just, you're not going into this as so much of a risk. You know that you have a support system behind you that will kind of push you to get you to where you need to be. I wanted to kind of do a segue really off of all, th all three of you now. Um, you have your own path. You don't have to follow the traditional path of everybody else. Um, so I remember when I, so I missed the Olympic games in 2016. Um, and I kind of realized at that point how arbitrary it is to define um, a, someone's worth off of how fast they move their arms and legs in the water from point A to point B. Um, but it's really more about the process and the people you meet, the places you go, the skills you develop, um, you know, just everything and the experiences you get to have. And so I chose a more non-traditional route after that uh, within USA Swimming. So a lot of the US swimmers will stay at home and just train, 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 train until the summer and then go off and be summer superstars. Um, I wanted to travel the world. 
And I decided that it would be more worth my time and experience to do the World Cups. So instead of doing one country for two weeks in the summer, I did nine countries and I started meeting people and I started making more of those connections. And I did not regret that for a second. And some could say that maybe it was a detriment to my swimming. Maybe I could have gone farther or gotten more records. But honestly, now that I am retired, no one asks me how many records I have or how many medals I have. But I say, hey, I've been to this many countries and it lights up. And this is how many friends I have from around the world. And I am so, so happy that I started looking at the process and the experience. Um, I, I did get to reach my goal. That is one thing, reaching your goal, absolutely. Um, but to what Bill was saying is, is why are you there? And here's the biggest thing. I want to give every swimmer permission to know that it's okay if you don't want the Olympics to be your goal. That's okay. You have to be really, really headstrong and have that be your absolute passion to do that. It's okay if that's not your passion. It's completely fine. If your passion is to make it to college swimming, if your passion is to go to different um, competitions around to different parts or just for the social atmosphere to stay healthy, that's phenomenal. But you get to pick your path and you get to pick why. You don't have to follow the, the traditional guidelines of it. But I feel like swimming itself and just water, water sports themselves um, really helps create that time management skill and help create those opportunities, kind of like Mon was saying, um, just look for them and ask ask for them, ask questions, keep learning, keep moving around and trying to find ways of how your sport can benefit you. It's not going to come knocking on your door. You have to ask and you have to look. Yeah, hundred percent. And going back to that sport is more than just what you do during your career. It really teaches you fundamental things in life. Now retired, I can see that like in job interviews, you don't say, you know, I, I did these many things or, you know, I don't even remember my times. Like, I, I don't even remember them. Like, it's what did it teach me to wake up every morning, striving for something that I'm really looking forward. It's my goal. I'm passionate about it. You know, time management, which is such an important thing. And, you know, all the athletes out there, whatever level you're at, you're managing school, you're managing your social life, you're managing sports, you're creating a community around you that's really sharing your passions, your motivations, your values. So really cherish that in your journey I think now looking back at the sport I don't remember the competitions really like I remember you know hanging out with Lonnie and talking you know before we had to jump into an 800 freestyle and with Monica you know like they took me as part of the Mexico team at Pan American Games and I was rooting for Mexico the whole time so you know and meeting Brio when I was really little and her being kind of that role model for me inspiring me to do that and now seeing Bill you know like he's such an inspiration so sport is so much more than you know what people define as success like you define your own success and I think that's super valuable and going back to what Lonnie was saying you know uh, usually in Central America Latin America Caribbean we don't have those opportunities to build really that community like I remember I trained alone the whole time I I didn't have teammates that I could you know go off of like Moni's experience in Germany so it's really finding where where's your passion what motivates you and if you can surround yourself with people that support you that's where you need to be and yeah you know go for it find your opportunities at that point um and I think in that line it's so important that we don't realize everything that we have to balance as athletes right whether it's you're in school whether it's you're in college or you're you know fully committed to your sport so What's your guys' take on prioritizing balance in athletic life? Have has there been you know any techniques that have worked for you guys or what practices that have been really crucial for your well-being? Um, I think something that really helped me always going through college um, and swimming at the same time. So I I studied economics in college and then I was more interested interested in like the business world. Um, and everyone. I feel like when you're in college and you're in high school, when you're an athlete, they kind of tell you like, oh, you have to sacrifice one for the other, you know, like you either swim very well or you're going to be very good in school. And I saw in my teammates and in myself that that's not true. You can excel in both, not very easily. It's going to take commitment. It's going to take pretty much all of your time, but you can do it. And I think the key to that is that 
When you're doing each of those things, you do them 100%. If I am in practice, I am 100% present and I am focusing 100% on practice. I'm not thinking about my problems in school. I'm not thinking about my friends or wanting to go out on the weekend. I'm in practice. But when I'm in class, I'm 100% in class. I'm not thinking about swimming or that I'm going to practice after this or that I shouldn't be paying attention because I just came from a three hour practice. I'm a normal student and I'm gonna put in 100% of my effort. And the same is with your social life. If you are hanging out with your friends, be 100% with them. Don't talk about, if you wanna talk a little bit about swimming, but go outside of that, get to know people outside of your circle in sports, just give 100% to the thing that you're doing at the moment. And you're going to be able to be extremely successful in everything you choose to do. Monica, I love that. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, one thing too. So for everyone listening who, who hears what we're saying, if you have the thought, oh, I wish I could be like that. Again, I'm going to, I'm going to like say this so many times, but Let's say that prioritization that Monica has, she's really, really good at being 100% there because she practiced that. It takes practice. If you think of each of these skills that we have as muscles in your brain, you have to practice that. Um, but I, that was a really great, really, really great example. Love that. Good. And I love what you said about sacrifice. Someone actually said this, and that's how I feel today. You know, you guys come on, kind of all said this, but you know, there's so much knowledge, like for your mom, where she said, that's what it is to be a champion and, you know, and sacrifice. And someone told me, you know, there's no such thing as sacrifice because you're doing what you love. So what are you really sacrificing? You know, and there's never going to be enough hours in the day to do everything that maybe the world wants you to do, but you're constantly learning and you're going after and you're doing what you love. So, you know, push forward because in our shortcomings, that's where our success comes from. So, you know, love what you do and everything else will fall into line. And I think when you talk about sacrifice, for example, I think it's tough. There's probably a lot of young people here and you probably feel like on Fridays or on Saturdays, you're missing out on what your other friends are doing and you can't go to the birthday party and you can't do this other thing that everyone else is doing. But then think like, I used to always think, all these people don't get to travel the world for free and meet a bunch of people from all over the world and, you know, hang out with some of the coolest people ever. And they don't get to have a family that, you know, my teammates were like my family. They don't get that. So it's one thing for the other. So you're not like sacrificing, but not getting anything in return. You're sacrificing, but you're getting something so much cooler in return. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was just about to say that, but also, um, this is really, really hard, especially because if you're an aquatic athlete, you are probably exhausted 24 um, seven, but be, be willing to make the plans. If you miss all the parties and you miss all the movies, miss all those, like find a day in your schedule and send it out to them. Hey, let's do this thing. And if you get to plan it and you're, you're there, like it really does. It, it's heartbreaking to me sometimes when working with younger athletes and they have to miss all these things and they feel like they're missing out. But and then helping them understand that they're gaining so many experiences that the others don't get to have. But in your free time, find a day, find that Sunday afternoon that you don't have practice, so you're done with your schoolwork, and make a play date with your friends. Like make a party with your friends so that you you can add those in. You just have to take a little bit more responsibility in making it happen. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think um, it depends, right? Like all the life stages. Like I remember. When I was little, I wish I, I would have made the time to do that, you know, and then you move on to college and then you can build your own schedule and you kind of find those little moments. So I would say, and even everyone has different goals, right? Like we have club swimmers that, you know, if you really want to do something, then it's like a priority, like a priority, right? Like, can you make a practice? Can you not make a practice? So just be sure, you know, like you're having those conversations with your coaches, with your teammates, kind of like what what's what's your motivation right like also what is important for you in life because I think that's so important and usually when you're training at such a focused level I think we sometimes lose sight of what's outside of that little bubble and I know I lost sight for a really long time when I was training to qualify for the Olympics and nothing else mattered now looking back maybe that wasn't healthy it got me to the goal but you know you need to prioritize you know like what what are your values like what really matters to you in life and it's fine 
it's fine either way. It's fine if you really just, you know, want to focus on that and want to stay completely committed. And it's also fine if you don't. So don't feel like exactly what Leah was talking about. Like there's no one path for everyone. And it's fine if one day, you know, like one day is not gonna completely affect everything else if you're you know doing other things it's also fine it's good for your mental health also if you need a break that's fine too I know I was trained to never think that you needed a break and until I fully burned out in college I realized that wasn't true so you know listen to your body and listen to you know what what your experience is at the moment and I think it's okay to enjoy the little things yeah you know maybe it is you know, like as small as just saying, okay, I'm going to go and have dinner with friends or tonight I'm going to sit down and watch Netflix and do nothing else and just let my mind go. You know, the little things that we enjoy, again, it's, it's fine to relax, relax, be yourself, you know, be with your friends, be with your family, be alone, whatever makes you happy. There's no, you don't have to worry about fear of missing out or, or people doing something without you because once you kind of evaluate your life and what your future holds for you, I think there's, it just opens up everything. Yeah, a hundred percent. And there's one thing I've always wanted to ask uh, you guys, especially since I've known you for such a long time. Um, you know, what is one thing that most people don't know about you? That is like a really harsh reality of the life of an athlete. And what do you wish people were more aware of when it comes to it? <laughs> yep. Can I write a book first? <laughs> <laughs> we need we need a whole book for it. Well, I'll I'll take one section, and maybe maybe this will help everyone kind of pick a section. Um, I want to go with body image. In swimming, you can see everything. There's no hiding what your body looks like. No hiding it. Um, and it might take a while, I think, especially for girls, because not every girl is going to look super masculine. I looked very masculine. I put on muscle very, very easily. And you could still Google images where people have Photoshopped my muscles to be like bigger than my head. And I, <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's funny because I'll going into different, um, job positions now they'll, they'll google me and right away just comes up a ton of swimsuit shots of just competitions and that's all i'll really be known for is my body type and it's so strange now but um understanding that it's okay to see that as a sacrifice too i remember wanting to have the more feminine touch look and, and not be quite as masculine but understanding that my body was beautiful and it had a purpose and every single body type is different every single body type and every single body type really is beautiful, but you have to know that it's beautiful. That is the biggest thing because no person looks the same. And whenever I find um, any, any younger athletes, right. You may have a hard time putting on a suit because their hips are bigger or it's too loose on them. Just saying that I think now we can almost point to so many different professional athletes and say, you have the same body type as that person. And they're amazing and they're fast and they're beautiful and they're confident and you can be too. And I think that it's really, really helpful to continue spreading positive body image and, and, and things such as that. And also, no joke, trying to share your favorite store brands. I have so many girls who will kind of be crying because their shoulders are so broad that they don't hit in their prom dresses. It, it's like a mortifying thing when yeah. you are told that you're beautiful, but you don't get to wear the beautiful things. And, you know, continuing to tell them that it's not your body, it's the dress. If I give you a toddler shirt and it doesn't fit, are you upset? No because it's a toddler shirt and it shouldn't fit you. And so I, I think I almost want to try like a different blog post to put out there of just all the best um, clothing stores to shop on online to try and fit different body types. Um, but I think that is a big struggle for a lot of women in swimming, just because we're given a figure from the muscle that we get to, that we have the opportunity to create be powerful with um, that doesn't quite fit the mannequin on the shelf. And so I, I think that was something that I kind of, webbed in and out of, of being really confident and happy about to not like when it came to sports, love my body. When it came to the elegant, you know, red carpet event, I struggled <laughs> and it was, it was really difficult trying to define those. And I just meet young girls all the time who kind of have that. Um, so I, I would always am 
um, encourage younger girls to reach out to other swimmers and even to older swimmers. I guarantee you, if you reach out to any higher athlete that you look up to over Instagram or something, and you have an actual question, they'll most likely answer back. If you, if you text them, hi, they might not answer, <laughs> but if you have like an actual question, I don't know anyone that wouldn't take time just to give some, some nice advice and just give some encouragement in that aspect. Yeah, I think going off of that and being like different and, 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 and finding your group of people and everything, I think um, through college, I kind of struggled with, like I said, I did economics in college. I was always very interested in the economy, like business things. And that's not very common amongst athletes. So I have sometimes felt like I didn't fit in. I couldn't have like those conversations that I wanted to have with my teammates because most of them were doing something in school related to, you know, uh, sports or something like that. I know kinesiology or biology or something like that. So I really had to find my people in that topic outside of swimming. And that is okay. If you have interests that are completely different than the people that you're around most time of the day, it's okay, you're not weird. There's people outside in the world that are interested in that too. And there's actually some swimmers, if you really look, that do that in life too. I was pursuing, I wanted out of college, I wanted to get a job in a bank. And I was like, no swimmer has, ever, like, I don't know any swimmers that work in this. Like, who can I ask for advice? And I actually reached out to Maya Dirado, who I knew had like an amazing career and everything. And I was like, hey, would you take 10 minutes of your time to talk to me? I'm lost. I don't know what to do. I don't know where to look. And she took time off her day. I didn't know her. I like cold messaged her on LinkedIn. So don't feel like you're weird. Don't feel like you're, you know, don't belong or anything. You can find your people inside of swimming, outside of swimming, just open up, have conversations. And it's totally okay. And sometimes it's even healthy to go outside of your swimming bubble and find other people because you can get so obsessed over swimming and over like, what times am I going and what, what meets am I qualifying to? The people outside of swimming don't understand. And it's wonderful that they don't understand because they won't ask you about it. So go reach out and really broaden your horizons. Talk to different types of people. I think it's the best thing you can do for personal development. I agree. The more that I, I actually worked for the circus for 17 years. And um, the funniest thing for me, or kind of the coolest thing was, you know, like having people, like I had a swim group and then I had my kind of circus friends. So having all of that and embracing who I was with all of those people helped me kind of stay grounded when I need to focus on my training or focus on work or focus on our workouts during the day. And allowing myself to do that and just, you know, learning from the people, laughing with them, having fun with them, you know, enjoying just being around all these different types of people, knowing that maybe they're in different groups and they'll never get together, but they're all have their own sort of fun energy. 100%. Lonnie, do you want to, you want to share something? Um, yeah, I mean, I completely agree with everything that was said. I think for me, it's a little bit of a different direction because I found like probably one of my most difficult, one of the most challenging parts of my career was having to leave home to go abroad to have the amenities and be able to train. And I know we spoke earlier about, you know, seeing what other people get to do and the sacrifices that we have to make. But in the end of the day, we all, all we also had pretty, we were pretty fortunate. It sounds like uh, everyone on the call has had great experiences, traveled a lot. And me as well. I mean, my current career, I'm living the dream for work. I'm traveling the world and I'm still in the swimming world. And it's great. But at the same time, when I think back to, you know, age 17, 16, 17, when I had to kind of leave my mom, my siblings, my friends, and it was great. I had, I loved the opportunity that I, opportunities that I had in the U.S., but at the same time, you think that it's a little sad in one way that in being on a small Caribbean island, we don't have access to a big meet every other month or every month even. Just living in Florida, I was racing every month, and there's three, 400 people at every swim meet at least, you know, and that was such a beauty, beautiful thing because everyone knows that uh, in the US they take sport really seriously and they invest a lot in it and the opportunities are really there and it's great. But 
it's almost kind of, I feel like I, I want to give more back to home and I don't have all the money in the world to build these like huge uh, venues or natatoriums and do lessons and teaching for everyone. But in the same way, it's kind of one of those things that I'm constantly always thinking about. Like, I wish that maybe things would have been different if I did have the training facilities and the team. Like you said, you were swimming alone for a really long time, m- most of your career. And for me as well, there was a period of my life where it was just me and my dad and it was tough, you know? And it's one of those things where it's just getting through that and pushing through that because now I'm, like I said, I'm living the dream and it's got me moving abroad has got me to where I am today. But understanding that that sacrifice or sacrifice in that aspect could actually, when you apply yourself, be probably the best thing to happen to you. Yeah, 100 percent. And especially with this panel, you know, we we see the good things as well. But I think something that a lot of people don't realize is sometimes the best moments in your career that outside people see, you know, like the smile or the happiness of the moment, you're like surrounded by good and positive things, um, whether that's through internal or external factors. Um, Was that the case that for you guys in those moments, people didn't see what was really happening behind, you know, that moment of happiness? Uh, What was that in your experience? Uh, Are you um, saying the, the bad behind the good, like the struggle before it? Um, meaning like if you had like a really good moment, but it really wasn't, you weren't only surrounded by good and positive things at the time, like what people usually see, you know, like now social media, it's, you know, the achievements and, you know, if, if you had like a really good success, they see like the happy moment, but maybe in that moment, you really weren't having a good day or you just had, you know, a fight with someone or you were really struggling that day. What was that in your experience? Go ahead, Lonnie. Oh, no, I would say to start, because I think that's a huge issue now. And you notice it a lot in all sports, that aspect of having to create this image. Fortunately, when I was swimming at that level, I, I mean, there was Instagram had just started, but there wasn't that much use of it or there wasn't, I, I didn't have that pressure to kind of portray any image. And again, I was really lucky. I was fortunate with family and coaches and teammates that I could just be 100% myself with. So I honestly never really felt the need to kind of portray something. Um, I kind of always felt my emotions and people around me knew that. I did have days where maybe I got beat in a race and I was happy for the person that beat me. But at the same time, I was disappointed in myself because I knew what I did wrong. So, you know, there are moments where you have to smile, but that's just good good sportsmanship. Like, congratulations to you. You're the winner. I'm upset. I'm upset about myself. So maybe I don't want to show it because I don't want you to feel I'm I'm angry that you beat me. But um, no, again, I would just say that fortunately, I didn't have the pressure to really have to show that so much. You know, now these days you see athletes are apologizing to like, let's say fans online for getting third and not gold. And really it's uh, it's tough because they feel that pressure from the people that are following them, following their career. And um, I just have to say that I, I, I didn't have to, to live that in, in my time. I think it's, it's a really strange kind of toxic thing. I mean, you, when it comes to social media, you see influencers and even kids apologizing because they didn't post on a day. I mean, it's who's, who's actually looking and who actually cares, like, but they have that social pressure. Um, with that, I know I, I was always told that um, people would always say, wow, you're always smiling. Like you're always so happy on the pool deck. And I think a lot of the time it was a defense mechanism and it was um, like a, a tactic to just kind of stay alive in the sport. That if someone made eye contact with me, I would just smile. And there were multiple competitions where um, I had a significant other at one point who just had a knack for having really big fights over the phone when I'd go to a big competition and it would just really mess with my head, but I couldn't show it. I had to just keep smiling. And I think that honestly, smiling through competitions almost tricked my brain into being a little bit happier and and forced the the dopamine into my system to really swim a little bit faster. 
And so I, I think that using that as a defense mechanism and coping mechanism, just smiling through the competition, that really helped. And so it may have seen on, on all the posts that I was always super excited and happy. And I, it was, but many of those times there was always a lot of fear and anxiety and worry that was hiding just under the surface. Um, heaven forbid anyone asked me, are you okay? <laughs> just burst. I mean, they were happy, like, yeah. I'm like, well, I saw you the day. Are you okay? No. <laughs> I'm like, can, can you ask me that over there where no one's looking? <laughs> I um, agree with that though. I think sometimes you have to fake it till you make it. You yeah. know, like there's times when, you know, like let yourself cry, but there are times and maybe competitions aren't one of them where you do have to trick your mind or, yeah. you know, like maybe like when you walked up to, you know, like Valerie, you know, mm -hmm. like maybe that little, that little moment changed that career or even just that day. So yeah. just that, that smile sometimes, and then it, it can work both ways. So I'm not saying everyone should always go out and just, you know, fake being happy all the time. But, you really? know, sometimes yeah. you do have to fight through that to really change how you're thinking and maybe people around you. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to note that everyone has struggles. Athletes are human. Sometimes we have to compete on days that aren't our best. We have something going on in our personal life or, you know, we're sick and we still have to show up. And I think that's like the great attribute that you learn as an athlete that the day doesn't have to be going perfectly for you to just show up and perform, but also you need to know where the limit is. There's things that you can swim through and there's things that you can be struggling with in the background and still show up to practice and still do your job and everything. But there's things that you can't. And if you reach that limit, you need to understand how to listen to your mind, listen to your body, and not always try to push through it. Sometimes it's okay to say, you know what, this is the limit for me today. I'm not okay. Today, instead of going to practice, I really need to take a personal day because maybe it's something that can get fixed today. And if I were to go to practice today, it's going to carry on and it's going to get worse and worse. So why don't I just take the afternoon off? I'll go take a walk. I'll go clear my mind. And when I am okay to return, I will return. Or, or if you need to talk to someone, your coaches are always going to be there. Your teammates are always going to be there. You can always find someone that you can confide in. And I think that is super, super important. Yes, you can do you can ignore some things but you can't ignore things forever and there's some things you shouldn't be ignoring so if there's something that you really need to figure out and fix then ask for help instead of trying to put on a poker face and trying to just work through the pain that's not going to help anyone you know at the end of the day you're going to crash you're not going to be able to perform so just understand where your limits are and listen to your own mind your own body you know yourself better than anyone and I hope coaches are hearing that too, mom. I hope a lot of coaches hear that from the higher end athletes and they try and I know coaches are human too. Coaches will have their good days and bad days. And unfortunately, if they say a negative thing, it can affect a swimmer for a lot longer than they realize. However, um, I think it's so important for both coach and athlete to try and create the relationship of trust. Yeah. If I show up that day and I'm swimming terribly, I want them to think there must be something wrong if her performance is right there. And so to have, to be able to feel safe and have that discussion. And that takes a lot of effort on both sides. I want to really, really emphasize that coaches, although you have to wear many hats and I know it's a really tough job, but try to create a safe space for your swimmer to come to you if they're having that bad day and trust that they're telling you the truth. And I think you'll be able to tell and get to know each swimmer through that, but being able to know your own mind, your own body, your own soul of, is it going to be more beneficial in the long run to take this afternoon off? And that sounds like such a luxury, Monica. I think that happened after I was out of college swimming and I am well, just- it, it never happened when I was in college, maybe when I was a pro, but- <laughs> NCAA has changed so much for the better, for the better. But I remember my freshman year, um, I, I didn't have enough money to have a full meal plan. So I had Tupperware and I would steal breakfast for my lunch. And then I think at my senior year, NCAA then allowed um, to offer free breakfast supplements, which is breakfast and free lunch supplements, which is lunch. Yeah. So you could actually feed the athletes. 
But I remember a, a basketball player came out probably in like 2012 or 2013 to say that he wasn't eating enough and that they weren't being taken care of. And I was like, I've been saying this for years. <laughs> so I'm glad they're taking care of him now. Um, but speaking up and, and being very honest and trying to have that conversation. And so if you have coaches that are a little stubborn and aren't quite listening to you, you have to approach it in a different way, understand that they're human. And we need to learn how to communicate that properly through them and asking for advice for that. Cause it's, it's a two way street between the, the athlete and the coach and trying to create that ability to have that safe space to take that mental day if you need it. And I think it's important to say that if you're a person that there's always something wrong with you and it almost starts seeming like you don't want to be there. Like these are excuses. Then it's probably like, people are probably going to be like, Oh, it's another one of those things, you know? But if you're usually the person that puts in the effort, even on a bad day, puts on a good face and tries to do things. If you're that person and you will go up to a coach and you genuinely say, I am not having a good day. I don't think anyone is cruel enough to not believe you and be like, I don't care. You still have to do it. So, you know, just balance things out. <laughs> What's that like to balance? <laughs> <Good question. laughs> what happened like after 2018? <laughs> yeah. And quick ad addition to that, not only if you're struggling mentally, if you're struggling physically, that's mm -hmm. also valid. You know, if it's either, you know, extreme fatigue or you feel like an injury is coming like you have to speak up because those things really spiral and I can tell you from personal experience after three total reconstructive surgeries and a couple extra ones in there like especially as Bria said like coaches listening like have those conversations with your athletes like Moni said maybe it sounds like an excuse but maybe it's like a, a cry for help a little bit even if they're not being super explicit about it so just having that open mind always and having those difficult conversations sometimes. Um, but thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing. I know we're almost at time. So I'll just ask one question from the Q&A that we received that I think is really great to close out the webinar for today. Um, what is one piece of advice that each of you would give to your younger self to enjoy the process and overcome the battles that came along the way? Um, I, think, I think I would tell myself that swimming comes with ups and downs and it's definitely tough at times, but you need to enjoy it while it lasts. Because now looking back, it really, it, for a long time, it seems like swimming was the only thing I ever did. But now I look back and I'm like, those were the best years of my life. So really just enjoy every single small bit of it. Immerse yourself in swimming. And like I said, if swimming is what you're doing right now, do it 100%. Like life after will be very long. You're, you'll have chances to travel and you'll have chances to go out with your friends and party. I'm not saying you should not do absolutely any of that while you're swimming, but like really just enjoy it and invest in the people because the people is the best part about this sport. Yeah, took the words right out of my mouth, so... That's what I was going to say. So I, that's my answer as well. <laughs> really the enjoy the moment while it's there because, um, uh, they they'll, when they're gone, you'll miss it for sure. And even if it is only certain aspects that you miss, maybe you don't miss everything about the really early mornings, the really long afternoon practices, the really, really long Saturday mornings, but you'll miss parts of it for sure. So just make sure you're taking it all in and, um, enjoying every second of it in some way and just to add a small one on to that for both parents parents coaches and swimmers after a race think of three things on each side so one what did you do well i i don't care if it smiled if you were excited if you had one good turn what did you do well and how do you want to improve when you start talking about what what you messed up or what you ruined i don't care about what you don't want to do i care about what you want to do so focusing on what to improve and what you did well will do so much better for your career moving forward than always harboring on what you did wrong. So instead of messing up on your turns, you want to improve your turns. It sounds so much better if you kind of phrase it in that positive light and gives you something to look forward to and work on instead of, again, harboring on the negative. So parents too, especially, I just, I work with a lot of parents and I constantly try to just teach them the positive 
vocabulary that is going to be so much more helpful to swimmers of all ages rather than being upset with the performance. Like if you gave 100% effort, no one should be upset. Let's just continue to move forward and on what we, the swimmer can, but coaches and parents, I don't feel like have room to be upset. They just need to help them improve onto the next step. I agree with that because that moment's gone. You can't get it back. So you can live for every single moment, but that's part of the journey. If we walked into a pool one day and then the next day we were at the Olympics, the memories that we wouldn't have and the learning and the experiences, you know, we would lack so many. And if I could tell myself something, you know, I say, just enjoy it because your future holds every part of your dreams, you know, and like to see all these little kids and they're so upset that maybe they didn't get on a certain team or they didn't do well one day, but you know, like that's, what's motivating them to be better the next day and to learn. And again, you know, like that doesn't define their career. And one last little small tip that really helped me. It, can, it came from Steve Boltman, my coach in college. He, I really struggled a lot with like the mental aspect of sports, especially in competitions, especially in like important competitions. And I guess I would have a lot of like negative thoughts and negative talk, uh, talk towards myself. And Steve would always tell us, would you ever talk like this to another person? Would you ever say that to another person? Uh, no, if the answer is no, then don't say it to yourself, you know? Learn how to be your own best friend. Yes. That's huge. Learn how to be your own best friend. Be nice to yourself. Yeah. When it, and sometimes I'll tell, those, I'll tell those kids, they're like, I messed this up. And I'm like, that's so rude. Stop talking like that. That's such a mean <laughs> thing to say to yourself. <laughs> like learn how to be kind, be mm -hmm. your own best friend. Yeah, and, and they're all different. Everyone learns at different phases and different levels and different times. So, you know, like you, we can't expect ourselves to be exactly like the other person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, really well said. Uh, thank you so much to all of our incredible panelists today. Lonnie, Vrita, Monica, and Bill. It was fantastic to chat about your aquatic journeys and really thank you for all your advice for the next generation. I think it's just really changing the landscape of sport. Um, so we really appreciate you guys. And we invite all of you to join us in the next edition of our webinar. It's gonna be on safe sport and aquatics. So stay tuned for more information on the Panam Aquatic social media pages. So we hope everyone has a great weekend. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.